Congratulations on season two of uh, Leverage Redemption. Thank you, sir. Um, and as a director, too, let's start with that. I mean, uh, are you having fun directing uh, episodes? Yeah, I'm having a ball. Uh, you know, this is a show that allows you a lot of freedom to sort of interpret stylistically, you know, how you want to tell the story, as long as you can do it in the course of, a, of an actual shooting day. Um, you're given a lot of leeway. And so I... I it, I enjoyed the creativity immensely and working with this group is, is, is like working with, it's better than working with family because I fight with family. Uh, <laughs> it's like working with really good friends. <laughs> uh, but, but between you and Beth, I mean, I, I noticed that you have a certain signature as she does when you direct a film. I mean, there, there is a way that you place a camera, a way that you hold a shot and uh, it's, this is all learned because, uh, you know, you have a history of directing, uh, but you seem to really have a great eye for um, just the details in, in a shot. Oh, I appreciate that. That, that means a lot. I'm, I'm a constant student and uh, I spend all of my time either watching great work or learning about how great work is achieved and trying to figure out this very complex technique uh, that is filmmaking, uh, and I'm starting to develop a style. I'm starting to develop a, a, a taste, what you know, of what I like to see and where I, I think uh, this show operates well under. And in doing so, I'm, you know, I'm both getting more relaxed and more creative. So I really appreciate that. Thank is you. directing yourself hard? It depends. This was the first year where. Uh, Dean decided to not bring video playback onto set this year as a line item expense. It was expensive to carry last year. And the only real reason you need it is, is if you're an actor director, you want to just check it and make sure that it looks okay. And so for Beth and I to both have to do both sides of the line without that tool was extremely challenging, but it was probably very good dis discipline to, to learn. Uh, they didn't have video playback before Jerry Lewis invented it on, yeah. on the Nutty Professor, and you had to trust your cameraman, you had to trust the script supervisor, and you had to trust your own eye and ear. And so I felt like in some ways we got better as diagnosticians without it, and um, but it would have been fun to have occasionally. I think, I think Orson Welles developed uh, um, that that certain feeling of, of of being out of your body basically and seeing where you are on set and not needing to to, to check the to check the film all the time. I think there's certain performers that have the ability to have an objective and a subjective view in a scene at the same time. It's uh, you know certain actors are so incredibly invested in the moment of performance that they really do lose themselves and don't have any conscious knowledge of what they did during the take. I have great respect for that, and on stage I'm able to achieve that. But I've never been able to do that on a film set. I'm always conscious of where the light, and the camera, and the microphone are because if you're you can give a great performance, but if it's in the shadow, you're going again. <laughs> You know, no one hears you. You, you know. scratch your microphone with your fingers while you're talking and you're going to be doing it again. So if you don't want to keep doing it again and again, it te it's good to understand the technical aspect at the same time. And um, it helps a lot when you're directing because you, you're you conscious of it, but you're not conscious of it. Do you miss live performance? I do and I don't. You know, I tend, I, that, I, in the, I look at being on stage the same way I look at going to the gym. I look at it as a necessary evil. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you have to go to keep your instrument in shape. You have to put yourself out of your comfort zone and push yourself beyond what you want to in order to be accessible and ready for for the other kinds of work, you know, which are, require a different discipline. But stage is where that muscle gets built for me. Season two of, of Leverage Redemption uh, opens up uh, a lot of humanity for each of the characters. They're, everybody's going through certain problems. And this is such a great return to, I think, what it, we originally uh, fell in love with was, you know, everyone is flawed. And yet um, the whole uh, the whole crew buoys everybody up. And what a, what a great writing uh, experience this is. It's about the cases, but it's really about the characters. And it's about the characters, how they deal with each other in the context of the cases and how the cases resonate with certain characters more than others in terms of and that level of investment coloring the way that they go about doing their jobs. So it's a really delicate souffle recipe that somehow um, 
they're able to come up with. I got a really great vantage point this year being in the room and watching it and realizing that it's there's no magic spell. It's just a lot of really smart people just grinding it out and kicking in a bad idea sometimes way past the point of comfortability and then watching a golden nugget pop out of it. You're like, oh, wow, this is the process. Of all the characters that you deal with in the show, I think I think you you seem to really have a closeness with Gina as far as a scene partner. Um, there, there is certainly a, a great deal of respect between these two actors. I think that's true. I mean, I think the characters in some ways are forced into being the grown-ups on the show. And, <laughs> you know, while Beth and Stone and, or, or Parker and Stone and... Uh, and uh, I keep wanting to call her Lisa, uh, Brianna, yeah. um, sometimes get to do the, the wilder, wackier stuff. Uh, but I think dramatically, the reason why Harry signed up to come back to the crew was less about his desire to get back into the costumes and the accents and more because her character expresses a very rare vulnerability with him and asking him to be a bit of a mirror for her. And uh, the Sophie Devereaux character is really one that's been a, a mystery you know, nobody knows a real name. Nobody knows much about her backstory. And this season is a big dissection on that. Uh, why she's invulnerable, why she's shrouded in mystery, what skeletons will come back out of the closet. And Harry provides a really interesting sort of sounding board and confidant to her during that process. So, yeah, and, you know, I'm I'm such a lover of Shakespeare. And there is something certainly Shakespearean about this particular uh, uh, series. I think that's well. The, the the stakes are always operatically high, and uh, you're you're blending uh, something that it, ha it has to appeal to the front rows and has to appeal to the back row, right? You have to have the humor, and you also have to have the intelligence, and you have to be calibrating back and forth uh, constantly. And so, I think in that way, it is very Shakespeare. In this uh, next season, though, what do you think audiences are going to actually take away from when, when they see these episodes? You know, it's one of those Rorschach test shows. You know, I think people tune in. Some people are huge Stone fans. You know, Christian has a fan base that's one of the most dedicated I've ever seen a performer have. Mm -hmm. And they tune in to watch Christian and they tune in to watch him fight. And they tune in to watch him get frustrated and to yell at people and to do what Stone does. Um Similarly, Gina has her fans. Beth has her fans. The show has its fans who like watching the cases and sometimes they like watching the jokes. You, know, you try to satisfy all of that. And, and I'm really gratified that I think we did on a percentage level pretty high as a batting average this year. In terms of succeeding. Yeah, I mean, you, you have a worldwide fan base. Does that amaze you? It doesn't amaze me because I remember how rabid the original show's following was. And I know that it's only grown in exile, which is extremely rare. But um, I'm always amazed when an American story translates to a foreign culture. I was always amazed that ER was as popular around the world mm -hmm. as it was because I saw it as a very American show. But then you realize, no, it's about humans. It's about people. It's about relationships that are archetypal and about trying to do good in a difficult situation. And that is a very universal theme. So in the theme of the show, are we going to steal a season three? Oh, I hope so. You know, <laughs> weird world we live in with the way TV works. And they'll air a couple. They'll look at the alg algorithms and um, hopefully not send us right back to Louisiana in the middle of the summer, in the middle of hurricane season to do that season three. But uh, should that be what we're asked to do? I, I would answer the call. Uh, and I'm I'm hoping I get to do a set visit this year. It's it's uh... come on. Something I've been asking for, and Dean, Dean finally said, well, if there's a season three, we'll have you on. So Background check finally cleared, huh? They yeah, I did. And, uh, your, uh... No convictions. Um, <laughs> anyway, Noah, it's always great to talk with you and, and, and see you. Congratulations on the extended audience that Librarians has now on, on the different platforms it's on. Thank you. Yeah, maybe we'll reboot that one, too. Who knows? I would love to see a Librarians movie. You and me both. Yeah. You, both. you take care. You too, sir. Be well. Bye-bye.